Across the UK, property development is a controversial business, but it's here in Edinburgh where there's limited space and a pressure for high income private accommodation that things between developers and communities have been particularly fraught for a long time. I've lived in Edinburgh all my life and I've seen countless private developments go up with minimal consultation with local communities, while community centres, sports centres, schools and local businesses get knocked down in favour of high returns private accommodation. One of the best examples of this type of conflict was the Save Leith Walk campaign, where campaigners took to the streets and town halls to protest the knocking down of a block on iconic Leith Walk. This is Leith Depot, a beloved and frequently invoked example of one of the many businesses that would have been lost to this development. Leith Walk has the highest local population density in Scotland and one of the highest in the UK so developers didn't quite realise what they'd bitten off when they took on this community. To great relief and some surprise, the campaign won and the proposal was dismissed. However, like any anti-planning campaign, it took a long time and it's still subject to future appeals and the plans of developers. So I'm going to talk to David Wallacher, a key organiser of Save Leith Walk, to find out just what it's like to actually be part of such a vibrant but drawn out campaign. Hi there, David. How are you doing? All right, it's good to see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah you too. Come in. Come in. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. All right. All right, I'll just shut the door. Right. So, David, you were one of the main organisers of the Save Leith Walk campaign, which took place a few years ago. How did you hear about this? How did you become involved? Um, I found out about it uh, because, obviously, there was, I live here and the the building over the road obviously heard about it because of the planning you know application was put in and then it, there were serious problems uh, from as soon as i saw what was going on then i realized you know it was going to cause me problems as well uh, and yeah but that was it you know so and um, there was a meeting i think it was from the initially at the community council and quite a lot of people went to that and uh, it was at that time, and somebody said, well, you know, we need to organise something here, and then just a group of people formed at that, literally that meeting, swapped yeah. addresses, and that was how it started, yeah. Planning is described as being in the public interest, but it's often argued to go directly against public interests. Why was this campaign in the public interest and important for the community, and not just, uh, we don't want this in Leith? I think what had happened, uh, if I could go back into a little bit, back yeah. a few years before the campaign, what had happened in Edinburgh uh, had been, there'd been a very strong push uh, for development and for attracting people here to Edinburgh for various reasons, uh, business, hotels, you know, all mm. sorts of things. And there was a department called PLACE, uh, which is the organisation which attracts. And that set up I think it was a framework of thinking where they felt because it was they felt they I think in one way they could do what they wanted mm -hmm. and nobody and not up to that I think up to our campaign actually no, nobody had really forced back on them uh, about the fact as well what are you actually up to and what are you doing and I think also LEAF itself historically has had a bit of a let's say a relationship with Edinburgh which mm -hmm. has not always been a, you know the, of the happiest mm -hmm. uh, because I think, you know, you know, there's the old thing, Leaf was taken over by Edinburgh. And since then, Edinburgh has made the decisions of what to do in Leaf. And a lot of them have not been very good over, over historically. So this was, you know, another, like, here we go again bit. You know what I mean? So. Do you think this was a privileged campaign due to the people that were able to get involved? that the vibrancy and social capital of Leith was one of the things that saved it? Yes, I do. And I think we were very lucky. I, I, just going back on the thing before, I think because Leith has changed quite a lot, especially in the last 20 years and especially the last 10, 5 years, uh, Leith lost a lot of people who were, let's say, a professional class in the 60s and 70s because they all left because, it, you know, all the businesses and all the docks died off and into the so and I think what happened there became a new influx of people in and the, and you know 
certainly had some, you know, it helped that, that, that had an education and background in various fields. So, uh, so it, it sort of just gelled at the right moment. So, yeah. uh, you know, there were people who had the skills yeah. uh, from various areas. Like myself as an artist, I knew quite a lot about, let's say, communication, uh, yeah. about how communication works, uh, because that has been one of my main interests in art, actually. So this sort of, in a way, was just became more of a realizing in the real world what I was doing in my art already, which was quite interesting for mm. myself. And I think that happened for a lot of people. Um, and also we had a lot, quite a number of foreigners, uh, people from other countries, mm. uh, who, like myself, I'd come from abroad. I've lived, although I'm British, I'd lived abroad for a long time. So I did, had a different, different, different perspective. So I'd came, I, I was involved and I'd come in. I, I hadn't just lived in Edinburgh all my life. I had sort of lived and accepted this is the way the norm is. And I, and I think this is also very apparent from other people who weren't from this country. You know, they had a different social background, you know, one was from Germany, one was from France, Australian, uh, American, you know, Canadians. So there was, a, that really helped to sort of, so we were able to work off each other, I think, as well. And then we had the local community as well, you know, who realized, you know, this is like, you know, here we go again, you know, and let's yeah. uh, see what we can do about it, you know. There's a lot of talk in planning worlds like uh, reaching consensus and we want a planning system that is not full of conflict, um, which you could maybe argue is slightly exploiting people's natural aversion of conflict to accept compromises. Did you find developers or other opponents to the campaign using coded language like that? Uh, they did to a certain extent on this. You see, I think up to that point, uh, they hadn't really needed to bother. They, you know, there were things written in documents. Mm. And the council and the planning and various things, they, they have all these documents and saying, oh, this is the right way to do this and the right way. And, and most of the time, they don't even, they don't even follow it, you know. Yeah. So, the, uh, and what I can say since the campaign, we were successful. The, uh, I think the planners and the, uh, and the uh, council obviously had to step back and think, well, you know, obviously the way we were approaching things before, we're having to change it. And there are still developments going on now, obviously. And what they've, you know, I would say actually they've manipulated the system again, basically to make it appear more consensual. Like now they'll go out and do, uh, you know, like a survey from people and say, we, well, we, you know, you asked, we listened, we did, is their, you know, is their slogan. You know, like we, you could say now, we, uh, you know, you asked, we listened, we lied. <laughs> you know, which is very much what they do now, mm. you know, because they, they give you a thing to say, oh, present it. And then, you know, and then they move the goalpost afterwards, yeah. you know, so... one of the interesting things that you know when it came to that day of yeah. it getting voted on uh, because it sounded like yeah as you said the um, the developers were very confident that they were gonna win everything is kind of stacked in their favor and then it got to that day and even the sort of Tory uh, ministers were voting against it and yeah. saying kind of this is the worst put together proposal mm -hmm. I've ever seen. That must have been a pretty good moment. Well, it was. And, yeah. and what was interesting, how badly prepared they were. You know, <laughs> we were very, very well prepared. You know, we'd actually practiced before the whole thing, you know, and, and all the people who stood, you know, and made speeches and so on. We'd all gone through it all before. And we were very aware about what we wanted to say. And we did have, you know, we did have a few, uh, you know, let's say torpedoes, which, you know, which is why the council actually voted 11 nil because there were certain things yeah. which in law uh, was, which were brought up and that, and it questioned the whole idea that if you're making a conservation area, you know, you're supposed to conserve it and improve yeah. it. Yeah. And, it's, and, you know, and that was, there'd been legal precedents on this and that was one of the main things that was saying, and that's what turned the Tories because they were, oh, oh heck, we're going to be, in legal problems here, you know what I mean? So, and I think there was a certain amount of, I would say, arrogance from the developers. You know, they felt, you know, oh, we're going to walk in this, do this. And of course, the university was up to their necks in this as well, the University of Edinburgh. They'd been, you know, 
pro active in sort of supporting this this developer in particular and, that, and there was another site St Margaret's house up, I think up on the London Road and uh, and of course the university didn't like to be seen in the public eye to be actually involved in something which was getting really contentious so and we knew that so in the end you know right from the beginning we were always trying to split the uni from the developer so we knew if we, if we could embarrass the uni really badly uh, that the developer you know that eventually it was looking so bad for them that they would sort of pull out to a certain extent which is what they did mm. you know and that worked very well Planning's often described as a war of attrition and uh, people get worn out by it, especially campaigners. Was that your experience or did you see that happening to other people? Uh, the whole thing was, was because it was such a, I mean, we had to start from nothing, literally. But I mean, very, though I say that, we did, but very, we were very lucky because next door to this house, there was a shop which was empty. And I knew the woman just by chance, so I asked her, I said, well, can we put some billboards up in the windows? I said, yeah, that's fine. She said, you can do that. So within about three days, we'd managed to get these fingers printed and up in the windows, and it started to explain, and people were stopping looking at it, you know. So we were, you know, and then we sort of got it all going, and then we were getting help from quite a lot of people, you know, mm. uh, quietly, you know, but giving us a lot of support. Uh, people who lived in Leaf and were small companies and things who were doing lots of printing for us for free and we were getting posters done and put up by a company, you know, all over, all over town. It was great, you know. And then we were free to start to be actually really start to be able to be really creative with the situation because we, we, got, we got up and running very quickly. So we could, I would say we were in charge of the narrative to a certain extent. We were able to, and I don't think the developers knew what hit them. How much of campaigning do you think comes down to setting a, an initial strategy? Did you find yourself fighting fires as they came about? Or do you think it's mostly just, is it stamina or strategy that helps the most? I think both. Yeah. I think, I would, just going back to the thing, because the last question you asked me about, uh, tired, we'll be tired, and we were exhausted by yeah. the end. We were absolutely, and it took us like, I would say, for me, it took me nearly a year to sort of get down to some sort of... It was so nerve-wracking, because we were having to pick up... Because when there's planning application, there were so many documents, hundreds of documents, and we had to go through them all, you know, and they were changing them all the time. And the, there was information in there, you know, that they did it... Because it was a conservation area. They did, a, like, a historical survey. And you... Unless you went into that historical survey and actually looked at it and and looked at their reasonings, and then you find actually it was it was a concoction. It, you know, it was just like it was basically made up. It was half made up, using facts which were not true, but they were trying and they were trying to define the youth by putting this building up, saying basically that it's part. It was part of the natural landscape because there was a building of that size there before, and in fact that was not true. You know, the, so we had to go and uh, basically that was what I was doing. I went off to prove that that before that building there, there had never been a big, like the rest of Leaf Walk, high rise, but they had never been there. Mm -hmm. And actually, how I did that was I went to the census records and looked out, and so looked in every house which had been there before, and you could see how many people lived in each building. And from that, you could work out how many flats there were, and then you could work out basically how big that building was. Yeah. You know, if it was a one-story, a two-story, or a three-story building, which they were. And in fact, this side of the street is still original. So it would have been, that side would have been something like this side. And in fact, it's like where the hospital is next door, there was a two-story building there until about 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it was a up and down, not like the rest of Leaf Walk with the big four-story blocks all the way up. Mm -hmm. And we were able, I was able to prove that. So that demolished their argument about saying that, oh, this is just going to be a continuation of what Leaf Walk was. You see mm -hmm. what I mean? As it went on and it got more to write up, I think to the, there were things right at the end. There was about five or six of us who were working very intensely because it was very complicated because of the planning laws and knowing about planning and... 
about aspects of the building, how we could prove that this certain aspect of the building was, you know, didn't fit into their own, you know, planning regulations and stuff like this. So I think there was a group of about five or six of us who were working very hard on that, you know, and we had to do a lot more work. I was quite honestly say that we did. But it wasn't that we were, it, that others weren't involved. It was more that it, it just that, because we knew, because we had the knowledge mm -hmm. and, and, we, and it was very, you know, it was quite fine, difficult stuff we were dealing with sometimes. Like I was explaining about, about how the houses were before yeah. and going into that, you know. So you needed people who to really concentrating to, and these were the people who were really worn out at the end, you know, mm. because they had, you know, it wasn't just a social media thing where yeah. putting up tweets and things like that. This was more like, you know, it was, you know, a battle. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a mental battle, yeah. Because I know yeah. you're now um, uh, kind of protesting against um, certain developments that are happening here. I think, was it the tram works as well? Do you think you've, uh, is, is there a certain addictiveness to camp? Do you feel like you've dipped your toe into something that well, is hard to Well, to uh, it's a good question. And the, it gave me a lot of problem for a long time because I'd been so involved with that campaign. Then the COVID came up. So, and of course, everybody was sitting around doing nothing. And I, I, I the certain, there were certain problems here uh, with, the tram, with the tram and the tram tracks, you know, and it's about vibration, ground ball noise and various things. And, uh, you know, it, there were very weak documents out of the council and what it was allowable. Eventually, I, I got hold of some documents and it, was, it wasn't good. So, mm. eventually, I, I had some sort of, sorting out but i mean even this tree outside here i had to fight for that for four years this bloody tree one tree and i'd had a promise off the council to save that tree right before right before they even started and i had it on and they still wanted to go for it and i kept saying no i thought this, you know i had to take it right to the top of the development committee to get that sorted out as, you, as you're saying, it, it, with planning, it goes on for ages and it, uh, it never really stops. And even when you uh, win a campaign against it, you've still got to deal with appeals and um, whatever future plans for the area developers might have. When, when you won, did you come away feeling triumphant or like a bit of a, a, a temporary nuisance to a rather unstoppable system? I think for, personally, because I'm living here, and I'm, I'm in the centre. I've been literally in the centre of a, a world, you know, a storm. Mm. There's just been one thing after another. Now, for a lot, number of people on the campaign, that wasn't the situation. You know, they're not actually living here. You know, I, there was the possible threat of this house being compulsory purchased. You know, they could have gone down that road. It's not very often they do it, but they could have gone that way. So I had that extra worry on top. You know, so and also. Just because there was a momentum in the campaign, and then the COVID, and then I, of course I w had this energy involved, so I was still in a bit of a train, you know. So I, I was still able, in one way, to keep going. But a lot of people dro dropped out; they weren't interested after they'd saved that building, because there were, let's say, those who just wanted to save the building. They didn't really care about the rest of the situation, you know. But there were others who did. Well, think more on a broader term about, you know, it's not just that, it is it is a whole, because it's about a whole environment really, and, that, and, and it's about, you know, they knocked down the tram sheds here, which was a huge tram sheds. Now, personally, I think that was a real mistake, you know, they could have done something fantastic with that, you know, there's a, there's a lack, you know, the, the, the council have these policies and they, they apply them and then the developer comes along and says, we'll do this, we'll do that. But there's never doesn't seem to be any overall, overall thinking. Well, we have this area. We've got these interesting buildings. What can we do with this? How can we combine and integrate it within what, the, you know, and how we do that with the group, the people, and the society around it? Though they come out all the time with these overall plans, it's all very like formulaic, you know, like oh, this is uh, this is our place formula or our space formula for the community. But then you go down to the harbour and you see the, some of these developments down there. It's like a wasteland. I mean, there's, there's housing and there's nothing else. And it's like, well, what about all the other parts that should integrate a society or in a community? Yeah. You know, and they have that here already and they still want to knock that down here. 
And they create, you know, it's unbelievable. I think their, their uh, foresight is actually very bad. And I think the, for, the problem with the foresight is because the planners have decided to go down these formulaic routes of saying, oh, this is the way we fix things in an area by these sort of overall, you know, they've got papers, somebody's written them about, as I said before, about, you know, oh, we created community. You know, and it's all a bit like, well, hold on, you've got a community there already. Why are you needing to create it? You know, you're going to destroy it and then attempt to create a community. You know, it's a bit mad, you know. Do you think there's anything in your past or your personality that drove you towards campaigning? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, I, I, yes. Uh, I would say, because I, when I was a student, I lived in Liverpool, and this was back in 1981, and there was enormous riots in Toxteth, and I was there when that all happened. It was quite very interesting. Um, and how it got played out afterwards in the media and what happened, and, and I, one of my strongest memories was, it was the Monday after the riot, and they'd sent in this poli the police. I think 10,000 were sent into Liverpool. And they were dressed, you know, in all the equipment, you know, riot equipment, helmets and everything. And they were, I was on my bike and I was cycling down the road and there was nobody on the streets, nobody, but these literally thousands of police marching like Roman centurions down, the, down this main road into Liverpool. And Liverpool at the time was really depressed city. You know, it had a lot of problems. You know, the unemployment was 80, 90% in the area I lived. So, uh, and at that time, I was like, I thought, what is this country? You know, I just thought, you know, this is crazy. So, and then I was, I was an artist and I started to move and you know, I moved into, I was in, went into Europe and then I was in America. And eventually I moved to Sweden. Uh, but I always had this thing about, you know, one of the reasons it was good, it, Sweden was a fairly democratic country. Things were done in a lot, a lot better than they were done here, you know. So when this came up, you know, it was like, one side of me said, oh no, oh no, you know, this is like, here we go. And I was really had to fight myself to think of getting involved in this in one way, but I had to, you know, there wasn't any choice. And I mean, I was a bit like, because, you know, I was tired of this. I've never seen it so much, you know. And I, sometimes I wonder why I came back to the country after a long, long time, you know. But there are other you know, aspects of which you have to deal with. Right? So, uh, yeah. So, but once I'm involved in it, and because I, I'd been in another country where I could see things could be done better, just because it could be done, you know, where people's views were respected, you know. And this country, you know, people's views are not respected. What, what changes do you think there need to be to the system to help boost people's trust in planning? I, I think it, uh, personally, there was a planning review about three or four, I think about three years ago, just about the time of the end of the campaign. And of course, because we won, the politicians said, well, you can see that it works very well, you know, because obviously we won. But of course, we were one of the rare victories you know, it's basically unknown, especially in a city, you know, to win. You know, you might win out in the countryside or in a house or something, but to win in the city like we did was, you know, people, a lot of people can't believe that we did it, you know. But so they didn't really change the planning thing. So it stayed the same. But they used our win to say justify that it was all OK, which was ridiculous, you know, because one of the things that were on the last planning review, which I think is every 10 years, was, which I think it was Andrew Reitman put it, put it out, basically said, well, if the developers can, as I said before, the developers can appeal if they lose at that council meeting, why can't the community appeal? Which is what we, people wanted, you know. That would have thought, we would have thought would have been at least basically fair, you know, but they wouldn't allow that. And the reason they didn't want that is because there's a policy to build like hell. And of course, the last thing they wanted were all these groups jumping up if they lost, appealing, you see what I mean? Because yeah. it was going to block, well, as you said, the, what was initially the consensus in the system, you know, 
And the consensus in the system is fine if it's your consensus, if you design the consensus, you know. But they know, you know, our consensus would be something very different from theirs, obviously, you know. So, is that right? <laughs> that was great. Thank you very much, David. That was very interesting. <laughs> All right, cheers. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So that just shows you how much perseverance and community outreach can do to push against huge systems like uh, planning and development groups. And also how tough it is to be a campaigner and all the many things you have to go through when conducting a campaign like this. Campaigning, especially against planning, is a war of attrition and I've always wanted to know how these conflicts take place and how the people involved come away feeling about it. I hope you can join me next time where I'll be on the trail of another development. Stay tuned, please comment, subscribe and let me know if there's a development happening near you that you don't like the look of.